Oke okay guys, so welcome back to our channel Independent Training Today series, still good corporate governance implementations We are going to hear regarding presentation from group 7 But before we are going to continue, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment So, group 7 will present good corporate governance implementation in Philippines context So this is quite interesting since also that University of Mindanao located in Philippines So want to know more about this presentation? Here we go Okay, thank you for is it group seven right okay group seven from university of Mindanao. thank you for being here is it uh, this is topic still good corporate government implementations uh, now it's uh, the turn of uh, being a part of group seven okay so please group seven can you introduce and then give me a little bit of your explanation regarding plan, uh, part of your uh, presentations Okay, thank you. And then the second one. Yes, hi. Um, good day. My name is Rocky J. Balaba. I'm the second reporter for our group. And, and um, I will be expounding the corporate uh, governance code of the Philippines. And I'll be tackling um, two actual corporate governance reports um, during my discussion. And also um, try to uh, explain how the Philippine uh, companies fare with other Southeast Asian companies in terms of corporate governance. Okay, so there's a bit of, co bit of comparison, I guess. Okay, thank you. And then the third one. Hello, everyone. I am Remarine Joy Pakote. Hello. And I'm the third uh, presenter in this group. And I will be presenting about corporate governance structure in the Philippine context. Uh, in my presentation, I will be showing to you the flow of rights and responsibilities in uh, organizations in the Philippines. Okay, thank you. Corporate governance structures. Okay, thank you. Okay, next. Hello everyone, I am the fourth reporter of our group. I am Eliza Watin and I am going to discuss about the cases of the corporate governance in the Philippines. So I'm going to show you the corporate scandals of um, AW Resources Corporation wow. and what happened to RCBC in the Bangladesh cyber money highs and also um, um, what they have done to resolve these scandals. Okay, thank you. So it's quite interesting. There's a, a bit of a scandal that you are going to tell in your presentation. Okay, then the last one. So hi everyone. I am John Cesar Bautista, the Hello, John. supporter of Group 7. So my topic is all about good governance, um, challenging implementation. And if discussed there, like what are the issues and problems on implementing um, good governance and also What's in it in the um, company or corporation for having a uh, good corporate governance? Okay, John. Thank you. So it's uh, it's more than what what we are going to face the the challenge in in terms of implementation good corporate governance. Okay, thank you, uh, Group Seven, for this introduction. So you can uh, start your presentations. Good day, everyone. We are the last group to report, and we will be discussing about corporate governance in the Philippine context. So to start, I am Charlize Gurria Mungado, and I am your first reporter for today. So in our past discussions, we have learned that corporate governance protects shareholders and stakeholders from firm value-reducing activities of management. This includes corporate failures, which is a consequence of weak corporate governance. We also talk about how strong corporate governance supports economic development by ensuring that investments from investors are not expropriated and economic confidence is assured. This leads us to review some corporate governance practices from different countries like Germany, Japan, China, and more. However, it defeats the course objective if we wouldn't scrutinize our own country's pattern of corporate governance as this would help us future business people tackle what is needed to eradicate 
add and to improve on in order to establish a strong corporate governance. So before I proceed to my topic proper, here is a little overview of the corporate governance in the Philippines. To start, the World Bank IMF Program of Reports on the Observance of Standards and Codes or ROSC completed a corporate governance assessment of the Philippines on September 2001. In the report, they discussed that corporate governance in the Philippines is characterized by concentrated ownership by a limited number of family shareholders within a bank-dominated financial market. It also mentioned that the Philippines has one stock market, which is the Philippine Stock Exchange, with 338 publicly listed companies, which is the latest count so far upon checking the PSE directory. And lastly, the Philippines have its own legal and regulatory body in the form of Securities and Exchange Commission. And just like any other country, the road to establish a code of corporate governance in the Philippines was also bumpy. The experiences and lessons it provided served as the foundation of the corporate governance code that was later established. Thus, in this report, I will be focusing on the beginnings of the Philippines corporate governance. Without further ado, the first law that solely focuses on corporations is Batas Pambansa Bilang 68, also known as the Corporation Code of the Philippines. It was enacted in May 1, 1980 by former President Ferdinand Marcos. This law lays foundation of regulatory requirements in which Filipino entrepreneurs are needed to comply to enter the local market. The Batas Pambansa Bilang 68 has remained mostly intact since it went into effect in 1980. However, financial scandals had been happening internationally and locally which led to updates on the provisions of the code. On 1997, for instance, corporate governance was noticed as a factor for economic success in the Philippines during the Asian financial crisis. The Asian crisis was attributed to a failure of corporate governance in Asian countries. Severely affected ones spiked the crisis included Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, South Korea, and the Philippines. Now, we would question how and why did it happen. Well, it all started on July 2, 1997, when the Thai government ran out of foreign currency. No longer able to support its exchange rate, the Thai government was forced to float the Thai baht, which was pegged to the U.S. dollar before. Because of this, the currency exchange rate of the baht collapsed immediately. Two weeks later, the Philippine peso and Indonesian rupiah underwent major devaluations as well, and the crisis spread internationally. This happened because controlling shareholders mismanaged the resources of all shareholders through their poor investing and risky financing decisions. The larger framework of corporate governance was weak and to extent that early warning signals did not generate countermeasures to curb poor management decisions. The crisis then led to international investors becoming less willing to invest in and lend to developing countries, not only in Asia, but in other areas of the world as well. Moving on, before the collapse of the Enron and WorldCom in 2001 and 2002, the Philippines had its own share of corporate scandals that helped build the foundation of the Corporate Governance Code. A major one was the Best World Resources Corporation, whose share prices hit record highs and then collapsed in 1999. I will just emphasize some points since my groupmate will dive deeper into the company later in this report. So... On December 1998, BW won the exclusive contract to operate a nationwide online bingo franchise as well as the wedding like Quick Pick 2 gambling game. The developments then triggered massive interest in the BW stock from stock traders and analysts until such time that it became the most traded stock in the Philippine Stock Exchange. However, the plan to operate gaming casinos was heavily opposed by the Catholic Church and eventually did not materialize. As a result, thousands of stock traders and investors lost millions in the process. 
the Philippine Stock Exchange then stepped in and investigated the company. It uncovered several stock price manipulation strategies. These scandals brought down the stock market's image and weakened private investor confidence. The scandals also have their roots in management's desire to project a false picture of performance with the aim of driving up the value of the corporation in a competitive global market. With the BW stock price manipulation and insider trading and the resulting loss of market confidence, it helped shape the way companies are directed and controlled at present since the investing public are wary of another BW scandal taking place. The next event that helped shape the code of corporate governance in the Philippines was the Enron scandal and World Bomb scandal in 2001 and 2002. The story of Enron Corporation depicts a company that reached dramatic heights only to face a dizzying fall. The fated company's collapse affected thousands of employees and shook Wall Street to its core. Enron's collapse and the financial havoc it wreaked on its shareholders and employees led to new regulations and legislation to promote the accuracy of financial reporting for publicly held companies. This situation worsened when the WorldCom scandal took place in 2002. The WorldCom was once one of the world's largest telecommunications company and a core dividend-paying stock that many retirees held in their portfolios. In 2002, it attempted to fake an increase in earnings on its profit and loss statement by nearly $4 billion. It did so by manipulating its financial data, which affected its income statement, balance sheet, Form 10K filing and annual report. After massive scandals by companies such as WorldCom and Enron, American Congress enacted the Surbanus Oxley Act or SOX. This was designed to increase confidence in stock markets and public companies so people would feel confident enough to invest. To do this, the new law made some big changes. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, a growing number of stockholders, formerly silent and acquiescent, now want to know whether board members are performing their role. They are likewise asking for more information that can help them understand how their money is being used. The then SEC chairperson, Lilia Arbautista, was doing everything to bring back morality in business, as well as institutionalize good and transparent governance in the Philippine firms. Thus, the formal code of corporate governance in the Philippines dates back to 2002 with the passage of the Sarbanes Oxley Act. The Philippine Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, a principal player in matters of corporate governance, issued Memorandum Circular Number 2, Series of 2002, otherwise known as the Code of Corporate Governance, under Resolution Number 135, dated April 4, 2002. In the Code, Corporate governance refers to a system whereby shareholders, creditors, and other stakeholders of a corporation ensure that management enhances the value of the corporation as it competes in an increasingly global marketplace. The code aims to promote corporate governance reforms that will raise investor confidence, develop the capital market, and help achieve high sustained growth for the corporate sector and the economy. Accordingly, the CG Code of 2002 was revised in 2009 through a SEC Memorandum Circular No. 6. One major difference of the revision was the role of stakeholders was removed and the duties and responsibilities of the Board of Directors and Management solely focused to the stockholders. The 2009 CG Code defines corporate governance as the framework of rules, systems and processes in the corporation that governs the performance by the board of directors and management of the respective duties and responsibilities to the stockholders. The following years, practitioners of good governance felt the need to form advocacy groups. One of those advocacy groups is Sharefield. Sharefield, or the Shareholders Association of the Philippines, is a non-stock, non-profit organization founded in 2010 by a group of professionals and investors to address the need to promote and protect the rights of shareholders. 
They also advocate for investor education and making the public understand the rights accorded to them by their investment in publicly listed corporations and how their investment can help secure their financial future while fueling economic activity and development. Another advocacy group is the GGAPP or Good Governance Advocates and Practitioners of the Philippines. GGAPP was launched on April 1, 2011 with the goal of promoting and improving good governance in both private and public sector in the Philippines. The 2009 Corporate Governance Code was then amended in 2011, 2013, and 2014 through SEC Memorandum Circulars. However, a major revision of the code was made on 2016 through SEC Memorandum Circular No. 19, Series of 2016, or the Code of Corporate Governance for Publicly Listed Companies, or PLC. The Securities and Exchange Commission, with some encouragement from advocacy groups, restored the role of stakeholders in corporations, which was removed in the 2009 version of the CG Code. The 2016 revision of the Code was also a major step forward as it aligns with the ASEAN Corporate Governance Initiatives and best practice from the OECD and G20 countries. The latest Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Principles of Corporate Governance and the ASEAN Corporate Governance Scorecard were used as key reference materials in the drafting of the code. One key element of the 2016 CG Code for PLC is the comply or explain approach. Furthermore, there are 16 principles in the new code and a total of 67 recommendations under the 16 principles. A PLC can opt to comply with all 67 recommendations or may seek exemption from some of the recommendations provided the PLC explains why it will not comply with the said recommendations, hence the comply or explain provision. Also, the 16 principles follow the updated principles of corporate governance as recently revised by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or OECD. The latest development for corporate governance so far was when Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte signed into law the revised code on February 20, 2019, which imposes strict requirements on listed companies. The Republic Act Number no. 11232, also known as the Revised Corporation Code of the Philippines, replaced the almost 39-year-old Batas Pambansa Bilang 68 or the Corporation Code of the Philippines. The law introduces fresh and progressive concepts aimed at improving the ease of doing business in the country, promoting good corporate governance and afford protection to corporations, investors, and consumers alike amid a fast-evolving business landscape. For the Philippines to effectively compete in the global market, the laws governing its corporations must be constantly updated to accommodate the fast-changing developments. To know more of corporate governance in the Philippine setting, my group mates will report the rest of the assigned topics. Thank you for listening. Good day. Again, my name is Rocky J. Balaga from Group 7. To further explain and picture out the corporate governance practices in the Philippines, I will present an actual corporate governance report of two publicly listed companies or PLCs here in the country. And let's try to analyze the compliance of these companies to the CG code. As mentioned by Charlize earlier, the Philippines has implemented the Code of Corporate Governance for PLCs in 2016. And one of the provisions of the code is for the PLCs to prepare and submit an integrated annual corporate governance report to the Securities and Exchange Commission. The CG code has 16 principles, and these principles are categorized into five main sections in the report. The first section is the board's governance responsibilities and this covers principles one to seven. The second principle is disclosure and transparency, which covers principles eight to 11. 
The third section is the internal control system and risk management framework. Uh, this covers principle 12. And the fourth section is cultivating a synergic relationship with shareholders covering principle 13. And the last is the duties of stakeholders that covers principles 14 to 16. This report is required to be submitted every year and should be posted in the company's website so that the public has access to it. Now let's go ahead and check these reports of the company. The first company that we will check is the Ayala Land Inc. from the property sector and they are engaged in planning and developing of real estate in the Philippines. So the commission has provided this template to be used by the companies in disclosing their compliance or non-compliance with the recommendations provided in the CG code. This form is divided into four columns. The first column contains the recommended CG practice or policy. The second column is where the company shall indicate their compliance or non-compliance with the recommended practice. The third column is for the additional information that the company shall provide to support their compliance. And the fourth column is where they provide their explanation for any non-compliance, which should also include how the overall principle being recommended is still being achieved by the company. And if you read the whole report of uh, Ayala Land Inc., which is actually very lengthy, um, one of the most notable things is that the company was able to comply all recommendations of the code, including those that are only optional. Their reports are also substantiated with uh, the following links and references to support their compliance. This full compliance to the CG code greatly reflects the dedication and commitment of the board of Ayala Land Inc. in the implementation of good corporate governance in their company. This also strengthened the protection of shareholders and other stakeholders and promote customers' confidence through full disclosure and transparency in both financial and non-financial reporting. Now next, we'll check China Banking Corporation from the banking sector. As expected from a financial institution, China Bank has also complied with all um, recommendations of the code except for one optional recommendation. They were, however, able to provide an explanation to their non-compliance and also provided what were the alternative policies they have in place to achieve the overall recommendation of the principle. So as you can see, the adoption of the comply or explain approach is in recognition of the fact that there is no one size fits all in corporate governance. Now, let's see how the companies in the Philippines is doing in terms of corporate governance compared to the other PLCs in the Southeast Asian region. Based from the 2019 ASEAN Corporate Governance Scorecard Awards, which was developed by the ASEAN Capital Markets Forum in partnership with the Asian Development Bank held last December 2020 in Hanoi, Vietnam. Four out of the 20 publicly listed companies are coming from the Philippines. These are the Ayala Land Inc., China Banking Corporation, Globe Telecom Inc., and SM Prime Holdings Inc. This goes to show how competitive the level of compliance and implementation of the good corporate governance in the Philippines. And I personally hope that more companies will aspire to fully comply with the corporate governance in the future. 
that's all of my report. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I am Remarine Joy Bakote from Group 7, and today I'll be discussing about corporate governance structure in the Philippine context. So this is the basic governance structure among uh, companies in the Philippines. I mentioned basic because, of course, we all know that there's no one-size-fits-all framework when it comes to corporate governance. So companies are still given the flexibility uh, to establish their own corporate governance arrangements. And these are based on many factors such as the complexity of their operations, uh, their risk profile, or the size of the company. And we have uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Philippine Stock Exchange. Uh, these two formulate guidelines for corporate governance and monitor corporate compliance. And of course, we have the shareholders who elect the board of directors. I think we all know already that corporate governance is driven by the agency problem or the uh, conflict between the interests of the shareholders, the principals, and management, or the agents. So the shareholders need to elect the board of directors to assume the oversight function. So we have the board of directors in the Philippines. Um, most companies adopt the uh, one tier or unitary board system. And we all know already that in a unitary board system, uh, the company is governed by a unified board performing both management and supervisory functions. So there is no need uh, for a separate supervisory board. And the code also explicitly provides that the number of independent directors should be two or at least one third of the members of the board, whichever is higher. And of course, we have the corporate secretary and the compliance officer. So the, cord, the code provides that uh, the board should ensure that it is assisted in its duties by a corporate secretary and a compliance officer. And the two positions should be given to two separate individuals. Now, both the corporate secretary and the compliance officer should not be members of the board of directors and they are primarily liable to the stockholders and the company, although they report to the board of directors. And of course, we have board committees. We have the audit committee, corporate governance committee, risk oversight committee, and related party transaction committee. These four committees are mentioned by the code, explicitly recommended by the code to be established by the companies. But of course, um, companies may have more board committees or less, and this depend on the company size, their risk profile, and the nature and complexity of their operations. So later we'll be comparing the board committees of different companies in the Philippines. Again, these are not uh, the only exclusive uh, board committees that companies should establish. The board committees that they will be establishing should, of course, be based on their needs and the other factors that I previously mentioned. And of course, we have the chairman and the CEO. Uh, the code provides that the positions of the chairperson of the board and the chief executive officer should be held by separate individuals. Uh, this is so that um, power will not be that concentrated. Now, the chairman will hold the top position in the board of directors and will manage the company's board members and the CEO will uh, hold the top position in management and will be managing the senior executives. Now, however, this is not a requirement. Again, this is only a, a recommendation. There are many companies who have a single person holding both the, uh, these positions. And of course, we have management and operations. So now we will be comparing three companies uh, from different industries. First, we have uh, Jollibee Foods Corporation in the food and beverage uh, industry. So uh, 
they have nine board members and uh, they have two independent directors. Uh, previously, I mentioned that the number of independent directors should be uh, two or one third of the total number of board members, whichever is higher. So they have nine uh, board members, but they only have two independent directors. So this is a, manif a clear manifestation uh, that companies are given um, the discretion in uh, establishing their own corporate governance uh, practices and arrangements. And of course, we, uh, we have here their board committees. They have five, the executive committee, nomination committee, compensation committee, audit committee, and corporate governance committee. That's for Jollibee Foods Corporation. And then we have Apex Mining Company Incorporated in the mining industry. They have seven board members with two independent directors. And they also have five board committees, but th these are different. Now, some are different from Jollibee Foods Corporation. Again, board committees are established according to the needs and the profile of the company. So they have a nomination committee, a compensation and remuneration committee, an audit committee, enterprise risk management committee, and related party transaction committee. And we have here, lastly, the Bank of the Philippine Islands in the banking industry. So they have the most number of uh, directors, board members, you know, among the three companies that we've been comparing. Uh, they have six independent directors and they have eight board committees. So uh, this can be explained by the complexity of the operations of uh, companies in the banking industry. We know that uh, banks belong to a specialized industry. So they generally have um, a more complex operations. So uh, they need more board committees uh, for the specialization of uh, the functions of their board of directors. So I think that will be um, all for my presentation. Thank you and God bless. Hello, Simoanya. Namasaya, Eliza Watin. So hello everyone, I am Eliza Watin and I am going to talk about the cases of corporate governance in the Philippine context. So I am going to share to you two cases. Number one is the corporate scandal of BW resources. And the second one is the involvement of RCBC in the Bangladesh Bank cyber heist. So first, the corporate scandal of BW resources. So long before the collapse of Enron and the WorldCom, the Philippines had its own share of corporate scandals like BW resources, whose share prices hit records high and then collapsed in 1999. These scandals brought down the stock market's image and weakened private investors' confidence. So what is BW Resource? First World Resource Incorporated is a small gaming company in the travel and leisure industry formed in 1998 by Dan Tatan. Both BWGE and BW Resources are subsidiaries of BW. It became certified by the SEC in 1998, listed at PSE. Its major stakeholder was Stanley Ho. It is a gaming tycoon in Macau. It changed its name to Fairmont Holdings in 1999, and then SunTrust Home Develop Developers Incorporated in 2000. It is now the real estate development still listed in PSE. Investigators by the Philippine Stock Exchange and the SEC revealed a grand scheme of market manipulation. It involved several Estrada cronies led by Tan, Estrada by what I mean is the former president of um, the Philippines, and a close friend of, I mean, close circle of friends and relatives and a group of influential brokers perpetrated for the benefit of Estrada and the members of his family, 
it combined elements of political corruption and financial fraud or market manipulation. So what sets the BW scam apart from the equally grand schemes of, corp of corruption during the Estrada administration was the combination of political corruption and financial fraud. It traces weak governance to the structure of interest in the stock exchange, weak regulatory capacity and the permeability of regulatory agencies to the influence of vested interests and political pressure. So the political corruption, BW Resources is a small gaming company. It is listed in the PSE and linked to people close to Estrada experience a meteoric rise in its stock market price due to suspected stock price manipulation. The ensuing investigation led only to further confusion when the head of compliance and surveillance group of the PSE had, and his entire staff resigned, and the event created a negative impression. The BW controversy undermined foreign investor confidence in the stock market and also contributed to a major loss of confidence in the Philippines among foreign and local investors on concerns on communism may have played part. Price manipulation creates the appearance of active trading in the stock in, the, in a certain stock to drive its price. There are many ways of manipulating the market. Wash sales, match orders, painting the close and transfer of shares to various accounts, then selling the shares back to the original owners among them. Tan and his group managed to do most of this and even more. So the, the BW scam is remarkable for its sheer boldness the average value of daily trades in 1999 reached 3.1 billion pesos compared with 2.7 billion pesos in 1996, the height of the stock market boom. At the beginning of the year, BW shares, which then traded at 2 pesos per share, accounted for a mere one-fourth one of 1% 1 of total market turnover. By October 11, the value of trades of BW shares hit 3.2 billion pesos, or half of the market turnover. The share price reached an astonishing 107 pesos during the day, only to collapse the following day, and then lost 60% of its value within the week. So, what did um, what did this? How did they resolve this kind of problem? So there is a vigilant reform. They created a Republic Act number 8799 or the Philippine Securities Regulation Code. So the SRC generally gave the SEC flexible governance to enable it to resolve cases expeditiously during the financial market investigation. The BWR insider trading scandal wow. became the focal point of the government policy to minimize, if not totally eliminate, insider trading. The market is now highly regulated under sections 23 and 27 of the SRC to eradicate bias in um, market activities on the part of insiders against the investing public. So what are the significant features of um, SRC? So it gave additional powers to the SEC to enforce securities law and address market abuses. It mandated that investors to be provided to, with up-to-date material information to enable, enable investigators to make informed investment decisions. It improved the integrity and the securities of market by requiring the PSE to go through the mutualization process and became a public cloud corporation. And it also provides better protection to minority shareholders to attract a more diverse group of foreign and local investigators. So the next topic, let's go to the RCBC in the Bangladesh Bank Cyber Heist. So over the weekend of February 5, 2016, a group of unidentified hackers attempted to steal $951 million from the Bangladesh Central Bank, BCB, in in Dhaka. So much of this was eventually recovered, but the thieves 
still managed to get away with $81 million. And this attempt is considered one of the biggest bank heists of all time. So the theft, so the theft involved manipulating the SWIFT system. It is a system which is a digital messaging platform that manages many of the world's interbank financial transfers to fool the New York branch of the U.S. Federal Reserves, which holds many international banking assets into transferring funds to accounts owned by the thieves. So pretending to be the BCB, the thieves sent fake instructions over SWIFT to the New York Fed, asking for some funds to be transferred to bank accounts in Southeast Asia. So to be specific, it was sent in the Philippines. So Thrift usually um, notifies the banks of transfers by sending the orders to a bank's printers. But in this case, um, the attackers disabled the BCB's printers with a piece of malware. This meant the bank employees in Bangladesh were not aware that the heist was going on. By the time that the BCB reactivated its printer and received the notifications of the transfers and requests from the New York um, Fed for clarifications, it was already too late and the money has been sent. While a series of spelling and formatting errors in the thieves Swift instructions halted in the vast majority of the transactions. A total of $81 million um, was transferred to banks in Southeast Asia and quickly laundered through, among other places, the Manila casino system. So what happened here? There was a human error in the side of um, the bank, the RCBC. In Manila, Philippines, workers at the Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation or the RCBC, um, they allow the attackers to open accounts using fictitious names, and these accounts were then used to receive and traffic, traffic stolen funds. The money was then withdrawn, converted into pesos, and laundered in local casinos. Mm -hmm. So what did RCBC do for this, um, for this kind of problem? So the RCBC strengthened its board of directors. They did a reorganization. And so for this, they increased the number of their independent directors from four, they make it seven. So the former SEC chairperson, Lilia Bautista, former Development Bank of the Philippines director, Gabriel Claudio, and the former city banker, Von Montes, were elected to be the independent directors. And additionally, RCBC paid half of the one billion penalty imposed by the Central Bank of the Philippines. So these are the cases of the KG in the Philippine context. Marami salamat. Hi, I am John Cesar Bautista from Group 7, and I'll be reporting corporate governance challenges implementation. I know that on our previous lessons, we already discussed what is corporate governance. But for now, let's identify, um, let's have a short review. What is corporate governance? Now, corporate governance, it is a term used to describe the balance among participants in the corporate structure who have an interest in the way in which the corporation is run. And those are the executive staffs, shareholders, and the members of the community. Now, corporate governance directly impacts the profit and the reputation of the company. And having a poor policy can expose the company to lawsuits, fines, reputational damage, and even loss of uh, capital investment. And according to the Secretary and Exchange Commission here in the Philippines, they identify corporate governance as a system of stewardship and a control to guide corporations in fulfilling the long-term economic, moral, legal, and social obligations towards their stakeholders. Stakeholders including to, but not limited to the customers, investors, suppliers, shareholders, creditors, the government, even um, the competitors. 
So the SEC focuses on fulfilling not to the short-term obligation, but to the long-term obligations to uh, the shareholders or stakeholders. Now, why corporate governance? What are the benefits of having corporate governance? Or should I say, what's in it of having corporate governance? First is to have a better access to external finance. Second, to have a lower cost of capital. That's the interest rates of loans. Third is to improve company performance sustainability. Now it talks about on day-to-day -day, um, operation of the company. The fourth is higher firm valuation and share performance. And the last one, which is very helpful in our organization is or in all corporation to reduce risk of corporate crisis and scandals. Now, I, let's have the challenges and issues of corporate governance. First is corporate, um, corporate governance has wide ramifications and extends beyond good corporate performance and financial propriety. Now, the complexity of corporate governance arises for two main reasons. First is that most countries, they don't separate um, the ownership and management control of the organization. Second one is increasing tendency to make organization more visibly accountable, not only to owners, but also to the stakeholders group. Now, on, in the case of the first issue, it is imperative to distinguish the nature of two basic components of governance in terms of first, policy making and overnight responsibilities of the board of directors. And second is the executive and implementation um, responsibilities of corporate management. And on the case of second issue, it's um, the organization makes more visibly accountable and the demand for more transparency and accountability on the part of uh, corporation. I have here five common issues that arise in corporate governance or the things that to be considered um, upon implementing corporate governance. First is that conflict of interest. Now, a conflict of interest within the framework of corporate governance occurs when um, an officer or another controlling member of the corporation has other financial interests and that um, affects the objectives of the corporations. Now, when conflict of interests are present, they deteriorate the trust of shareholders and public while making the corporation vulnerable to litigation. So it's very crucial um, to discuss about conflict interest upon implementing corporate governance because it may affect or it may give damage of the corporate and also um, remove the trust of the shareholders. Second is oversight issues. Now, an effective or effective corporate governance uh, requires to requires the board of directors to have substantial oversight of the company's procedures and practices. Now, the board protects the interests of the shareholders, acting as a check and balance against the executive staff. Now, without this oversight, corporate staff might violate state or federal law, facing substantial fines from regulatory agencies and suffering your reputational damage within the public. So this in this um, in, uh, issue, it, um, we know that how important it is to have um, to oversight uh, the uh, procedures and practices of uh, the um, organization or corporation. The third one is accountability issue. So it is necessary to uh, for an effective corporate governance um, to have accountability. And this is not only from the higher tier or from the higher level, but from the top level down to the lower tier employees. Now, each level and, and division of the corporation should report, should report and be accountable to another as a system of checks and balances. And without this accountability, one division of corporate might endanger and the success of the entire company or um, it will cause stockholders to lose, um, to lose uh, the desire to continue their investment. 
And the fourth one is transparency. So we um, earlier, uh, it was already buckled the, about transparency. Now, to be transparent, um, a corporation must ac accurately report their profits, loses, or losses, and make those uh, figures available to those who invest in their company. Now, overinflating profits or minimizing um, losses can serious, seriously damage the company's relationship um, between uh, the um, state uh, stockholders and the corporation. And that, uh, that in, in that day, um, our uh, in ties to invest under false pretenses. And the lack of transparency can also expose the company to fines from regulatory agencies. So transparency is actually one of um, the best thing to do um, to have effective and um, to have a good corporate governance in our organization. This is somehow connected to, um, I know that this issue is very critical uh, in our organization, but transparency, it, I mean, needs to tackle more about. And the last one is ethics, um, ethics violation. Now, the members of the executive uh, board have ethical duty to make decision based on the best, uh, based on the best interest of the stockholders. Further, um, a corporation has an ethical duty to protect the social welfare of others, including the great uh, the greater community in which they operate. So ethics violation, it revolves about you as a person. It, um, it revolves about you and how you um, deal with the problem and how you um, face the day-to-day -day, um, uh, uh, operation, how you cooperate with, um, within the organization or corporation. Now, according to James Thompson, she mentioned that for the implementation of rigorous corporate governance um, governance code, companies and institutions must come together regionally and internationally to draft corresponding guidelines. And this is my last slide. Last um, May 6, 2014, the Secret uh, Secretary and Exchange Commission in the Philippines um, uh, they revised the code of uh, corporate governance. It was approved the following amendment of SEC Memorandum Circular Number Six, series of series of two thousand nine, otherwise known as as the revised code of corporate governance. Now, to sum it up, implementing corporate governance is very crucial. There's a lot of things to be considered. It's not easy and it needs to have further um, study. So that's it for my report. Maraming salamat. Tarema kasi. Again, this is John Cesar Bautista from Group 7. Okay, so thank you guys for watching Group uh, 7. They are presenting regarding good corporate governance in Philippine context. They, they also present uh, several scandal connected to the good corporate governance implementation. So just wrap up the presentation from Group 7 and thanks for watching.